Um, well, before I start, I just want to say that um, the the image for that you've chosen for the conference actually could easily have been the first the first uh, slide for my for my presentation. Uh, it's very it's very representative of what I'm about to uh, to say. Um, British photography of the early 20th century was dominated by pictorialism. Photographers were claiming their role as artists, and the only way they knew how to achieve this was by following the aesthetic rules set by more established visual arts. However, photographs of buildings, with the exception of those that fitted the pictorialist vision, such as ruins or castles and landscapes, were generally regarded as purely documentary records and therefore not required to evoke an atmosphere but to convey accurate information. This was also true of other countries until a convergence of avant-garde theories, artistic developments and technological advances in photography, all related to the profound economic, industrial and cultural changes that followed the, the end of World War I, engendered a new way of using the camera based on the discovery of the unique qualities and capabilities of the medium. At the dawn of the 1920s, architecture was also to embark on a period of radical transformation. Over the course of the decade, the new photography and the modern movement developed simultaneously and in close alliance, changing forever the course of the two disciplines. Germany was one of the main centers of development of the new photography. At the Bauhaus, Hungarian artist Laszlo Molinaj advocated a new role for the camera as the instrument that would induce a new vision, a new design, a new way of seeing. No longer relying on methods of representations inherited from other visual arts, photography would find its own modern aesthetic derived from its specific technical qualities and from the effects produced by its own primary tool, light. At the same time, it would help the viewer get a new understanding of the world around them. New and unexplored viewpoints would, for example, allow them to look at even at familiar things in an unfamiliar way and provide the potential to notice what had previously gone unnoticed. Like other new vision adherents, Molinaggi was also interested in experimental uses of the photographic medium, such as photograms and photocollages. Photography's role was therefore no longer to simply document and represent, but also, and crucially, to interpret and create. Other photographers in Germany, such as Albert Renger Patsch and August Zander, were also interested in the camera as a new and independent means of expression which would result in developing a purely photographic aesthetic. They were, however, suspicious of the experimental approach encouraged by Molinage and the proponents of the new vision, and believed instead in capturing reality with a direct, dispassionate, and clinical outlook. Their work was linked with the art movement on Neue Sachlichkeit, New Objectivity, and their outlook most famously promulgated by Rengen uh, uh, book of 1928's Die Welt ist schön, the world is beautiful, a collection of images featuring both natural and man-made objects, often isolated from their context, and selected to emphasize geometry, pattern, and repetition. So their analysis of the object, Neue Sachlichkeit photographers understood the importance of the detail, which could in some cases be more eloquent than the whole expressed in the essence of the object. In their quest for detachment and objectivity, they produced images characterized by clarity, sharp focus, and, re and rigor, um, rigorous composition. The Weltischen was wid widely reviewed and positively received in Germany. Its title, not chosen by Rege Patsch, who intended to call it Die Dinge, Things, emphasizes nonetheless the aspiration of new photography adherents to find beauty in unexpected places, especially in ordinary everyday things. In the same years, Britain, as previously mentioned, still looked at photography on the whole through the reassuring lens of tradition and continuity with centuries-old visual arts. Germany was a regular focus of attention with regards to its photographic publications, both artistic and technical, reviewed and praised in the pages of the Photographic Journal, the periodical of the prestigious Royal Photographic Society. Some of the society's members actually ventured into straight photography territory, generally admonished by the more conservative uh, fellow members. Fo photographs of unconventional subjects, especially those fe featuring unconventional points of view, was, uh, were labeled as stunts and regarded with a certain degree of incomprehension, if not open contempt. 
At the time of the publication of Die Welt ist schön, René Pouch's work was already familiar to photography exhibition goers in London. Nonetheless, the photographic establishment, steeped in the conventions and cultural references of pictorialism, reacted with bafflement, if not incredulity. Both the reviews that appeared in the September 1929 issue of the Photographic Journal were critical of the content of the book, even if the Society's president, John Dudley Johnston, admitted that the work was of the high technical accomplishment. The other review of Bertrand Cox dismissed the book with comments such as, if uh, these photographic exercises are an emulation of the modern poster artist or of a crude type of woodcut, we feel that the effort is a mistaken one. However, Renger Patch's approach didn't lack supporters in Britain. In the February 1930 issue of the Photographic Journal, for example, the reviewer of uh, Deutsche Kamera Almanach states that, while the old photographic pictorialism um, sought to create an atmosphere, modern photography allows for the object themselves to speak. Photography no longer imitates other arts, but displays her own technique showing things and ways of life which art has failed to find or can ill represent. The new photography believes in frankness and the absence of make-believe. Modernist photographic techniques and attitudes had in fact been introduced in Britain during the 1920s, partly through fashion and avant-garde magazines, and partly thanks to a number of expatriate American photographers in London, such as Francis Bruguier and Curtis Moffat. New exhibition venues opened in the capital around 1930, challenging the role played by institutions such as the Royal Photographic Society in the previous decades, and familiarizing the public with the work of German, French, American, and Soviet representatives of the new photography. One of the key venues for the display of continental modernist photography was the Camera Club, reviewed in 19, uh, revived in 1929 by its new director, William Crawford, founder of one of London's leading advertising agencies. And this is a photograph of the uh, premises, uh, the new premises uh, designed in 1930 by Frederick Ketchels of uh, Crawford's advertising agency. And um, notice the, the photographers, Dell and Waynard, because you're going to hear a lot more about them in, uh, shortly. The agency's own gallery and the London Humphrey, uh, Humphreys Gallery in the publisher's premises were other unconventional spaces exhibiting photography. The climate of innovation promoted in the city by the avant-garde circles that had welcomed the expatriate photographers was indeed boosted by the rapid expansion of commercial and industrial photography, especially from 1930 onwards. Illustrated periodicals and brochures offered new creative possibility, especially through the collaboration between photographers and graphic designers. The growing advertising in industry did not fail to understand the popular appeal of straight photography as opposed to the elitist status of pictorialism and the potential of the new photography to create memorable and impactful images for its campaigns. In Germany, the possibility offered by photography to increase product appeal in advertising had already been discovered in the mid-1920s, and the precision and realism of Neue Zeichlichkeit imagery made it especially suited to its purpose to this purpose. In 1928, art historian Karl Georg Heise observed how Renger Patch's photographs were simultaneously beautiful, useful, and effective as advertising images for brochures and posters. Six years later, Neue Zeichlichkeit photographer Walter Nuremberg moved to London from Berlin and described with these words his new professional prospects. It was a gold rush industry and commerce offering better remuneration than the portrait client exerted a great attraction and promoted a general stampede. Meanwhile, there had been hardly any manifestation of modern architecture in Britain in the 1920s. And this is a classic 1920s building um, in London and uh, offices in South Square. Here is in photography, the conservative attitude and attachment to tradition of the architectural establishment caused them to look with suspicion at the radical developments occurring on the continent. Architectural education was equally unaffected by the new ideas that were spreading across other European countries. However, at the end of the 1920s, a number of key figures in publishing and in the profession became convinced, like their continental counterparts, that the old way of building was no longer suited to a modern society and that architecture needed to start on a new path. They embraced the approaches and ideals put forward by architects such as Le Corbusier, Walter Gropius, Ludwig uh, Mies van der Rohe, and Frank Lloyd Wright, and devoted themselves to both promote this architect's work and instigate a change in the profession. 
Among these figures was Hubert de Kroning Hastings, proprietor and editor of the Architectural Review, one of the most widely read periodicals in the field um, that was also, and crucially, interested in attracting a non-specialized readership. Collaborators such, such as Jim Richards, John Betjeman, and Philip Morton Shand provided the articles to advance the modernist cause, while the layout, often playful and eclectic, was transformed to accommodate the increasingly important role played by photographic illustrations. Architectural photographers in Britain had up to that point been expected to provide accurate and technically accomplished descriptions of buildings that had no more than documentary value. However, as previously pointed out, these photographers had been exposed to the new photography imagery through publications and displays in their own country, as well as exhibitions further afield that some of them very likely attended, such as the highly influential film on photo. Held in Stuttgart in 1929 and organized by the Deutsche Werkbund, one of the main centers of development of the new architecture, film and photo counted many out of town visitors. It showcased the work of Molinage, Wrenger, Patch, and numerous other uh, new vision and new objectivity photographers, as well as representative of American straight photography, and highlighted the close connection and reciprocal influence between cinema and photography. Another possible source of inspiration for British architectural photographers open to new approaches in the late 1920s and early 1930s is the work of German photographer Werner Manz, which clearly demonstrates how the simple, bold forms of the new architecture and its smooth surfaces in steel, concrete, and glass seem to provide the perfect subject material for a type of visual representation that favored geometrical compositions and tonal contrast. An outstanding representative of the Neue Sachlichkeit, Manz was a sought-after architectural photographer in the 1920s and 30s, who worked mainly for Cologne companies and architects. His sharp, vivid, precisely composed images, which tend to highlight geometry and occasionally border on an abstraction, were highly regarded by the architects who employed him. In the words of um, uh, Michael Euler-Schmidt, Whatever the terms of his, comp of his commissions, he produced an interpretative um, result of high aesthetic value through his sophisticated deployment of light, which had an extraordinary promotional effect for the architect. Two of Mance's photographs were included in architect T.B. Bennett's book, Architectural Design in Concrete, published in London in 1927. Supplied by Werner Hegemann, editor of the influential German magazine Wasmut Monatschefte für Baumkunst, these images stood out among the, uh, the standard architectural views that illustrated the book. It took a few more years for British architects to realize the impact that this type of image could exert, therefore becoming key elements not only in the promotion of their work, but also in the communication of their ideas and aspirations. Similarly, the specialized press started to grasp the role that photographic images could play, not simply to relate information to readers, but to influence their taste and outlook. As previously mentioned, the architectural reviews campaign in favor of modern architecture required powerful arguments, both in the form of written articles and of memorable imagery, in order to convince a still skeptical British public of the validity of the new design approach. The architectural reviews content also included articles on photography itself, and it is in its pages that previously unaware architects were introduced to the new photography. Firstly, by the 1932 article, The Still Camera Today, whose author Oswald Blakestone had made a short abstract film with Francis Bruguier, then, with even more powerful conviction, by Morton Chance, New Eyes for Old, published in 1934. Both articles were, uh, were accompanied by photographs by Molinage, and both asserted the unbreakable link between new photography and modern architecture. And I've got a couple of quotes here. Um, so the first one is past stages have seen the visible world with the eyes of the leading uh, creative painters. We see it through the camera's impersonal lens. But what we see is what men like Molinagi have taught us to discern. The magic of everyday things examined in close scrutiny and that arbitrary isolation of casual components which reveals the part as greater than the whole. And the second quote, the two fields in which the spirit of our age has achieved its most definite manifestations are photography and architecture. Did modern photography beget modern architecture or the converse? It is an interesting point, but since their logical development was simultaneous and their interaction considerable, it hardly matters which. 
What does matter is that it was the same sort of mind and power of vision which has produced both. Shan, who spoke fluent German and French, was a translator of Gropius's writings and a crucial point of contact between the British modernist and the continental counterparts. He also acquired the copyright in England for the photographs of many European architects, which therefore regularly appeared on the pages of the Architectural Review. However, the journal had already in 1930 made a pivotal move with regards to its imagery by employing as official photographers the groundbreaking partnership of Dead and Wainwright. Uh, this is a, one of the playful um, uh, advertising photographs for the sister uh, uh, magazine, the Architects Journal. They had made their debut in the Architectural Review in 1929 with their photographs of Finella, a house in Cambridge designed by young Australian architect Raymond McGrath. Aided by skillful use of artificial lighting and by an adventurous choice of viewpoints, they produced a set of striking images that made the most of the reflective materials employed by the architect and of dramatic cast shadows. What is notable and surprising is that the older of the two, Mark Oliver Dell, had in previous decades worked in a pictorialist manner, even if during the course of the 1920s his approach had evolved and he had spoken in favour of straight photography at the Royal Photographic Society. The pair's experience as BBC photographers and the use of, the li of a Leica in this assignment might have further pushed this tra transformation in Dell's work. And we also know that they worked in close collaboration with the reviews modernist minded editors. Um, this is an example of, um, with two photographs taken by Dell and Weirat, again, of uh, Crawford's advertising uh, um, office, uh, two worms, I have used very uh, new vision, and the uh, caption says, a composite picture showing two views of the facade, taken in each case from about the ordinary viewpoint of the passerby. Note the powerful forms of the shadows cast by the horizontal bands um, on the vertical steel mullions. Obviously, the text it's very much highlights all the sort of new photography um, main uh, points. It is still remarkable how quickly Dell and Wainwright developed their unique and highly effective style by combining elements of Neue Sehen and Neue Sachlichkeit, and in the process creating a powerful advertising tool for uh, modern British architects. Um, that's, for example, uh, an image of High Point One, obviously by Lubetkin and. Uh, the Pioneer Health Centre by Owen Williams. It is true that their repertoire was not confined to the work of these architects, but it is undoubtedly, undoubtedly here that Ellen Wainwright found the most suitable subject for their creative flair. Using large format camera and coloured filters to achieve sharp, high contrast images of uncompromisingly modern white houses, they showed they had absorbed the lessons of the new objectivity. Uh, this is housed by, by Marshall Sisson in Cornwall. Um, Christopher Nicholson, uh, ben, ben Nicholson's brother, his own house in Buckinghamshire, and um, Miramonte in Kingston by Maxwell Fry, some examples. Uh, at the same time, they employed compositional devices typical of the new vision, such as very low new viewpoints, tilted camera angles, and bird's eye views to add dynamism to images of commercial buildings, transport buildings, apartment blocks, and so on, uh, buildings of modernity. Here's a few examples again, uh, Peter Jones, uh, Sloan Square, and two images of the fanfare in Folkestone. Embassy Court in Brighton by Wells Coates. And the, the Daily Express uh, <laughs> building on Fleet Street. Um, and also how interesting, one of the photographs of the print works on the right is very very much noise, exactly. Kind. Um, in the photographs of interiors, and this is the electricity showrooms by Gropius and Fry, and in the photographs of interiors, as seen in the photo shoot at Finella, Dylan Wainwright skillfully played with reflections and cast shadows, as well as occasionally and unconventionally employing the trademark angled views. Um, this is the Two Wheeler Road, uh, we just listened, uh, well heard about it. The electricity showrooms again. Um, two photographs of offices of the practitioner magazine. Again, look at uh, the use of the again of the uh, uh, sort of uh, angled view uh, in interiors, and also the image on the right very much uh, reminds me of Neue Sachlichkeit uh, photographs. Uh, the same for these two. These are two composition of objects, and yeah, again the cast shadows play a very important role. 
And this is a photograph they took um, when they photographed a restaurant in Regent Street, and which uh, brings to mind um, the photo that Ringer Pouch um, publishing and developed is shown. Despite the frequent emphasis on geometry, both photographs of exteriors and interiors re uh, rarely rely simply on graphic values, but convey instead a sense of three-dimensional space perfectly suited to the depiction of architecture. This is the studio for Augustus John, um, also designed by Christopher Nichols. As architectural photography historian Robert Elwood puts it, their images leap from the page with an almost irresistible appeal and power. Dan Wainwright's work as a whole gave a fundamental contribution to the architectural review's effort to sell the new architecture and, more than that, to the creation of an enduring mystique in the imagery of modern buildings. Other British photographers soon followed Dan and Wainwright's examples. Um, is a few of them. Uh, John Morby, Alfred Henson. This is the um, High Cross House in Dartington by uh, William Scales. Alfred Crack now. Herbert Felton here photographing two displays at the um, aptly named Everyday Things exhibition at the RIBA. Sydney Newbury. Uh, among them, the figure of John Havenden is highly representative of the relationship between modern architecture, photography, and advertising. Um, there's a self-portrait by Havenden, with, um, which spells the uh, word photo in reference to film and photo, the film and photo exhibition. Um, having done a trained in the photographic studio of an American advertising agency's London branch and specialized in this field rather than in architecture. He worked mainly for Crawford's advertising agency, whose director, his brother Ashley, himself a designer wholly committed to the modernist cause, was instrumental in finding remunerative employment for Laszlo Molinaggi on his arrival in London in the mid-1930s. Having this foray into architectural photography produced outstanding results. His images of now iconic modern British buildings, such as uh, Bertolt Lubetkin's Penguin Pool and Wellscote's Isocon Flats, um, are among the most evocative of the period and bear the unmistakable hallmark of the new photography. By uh, the time these images were taken, the influx of photographers from Germany and Central Europe following the Nazis' rise to power had already started. Walter Nuremberg, Felix Mann, uh, Stefan Laurent, and Kurt Hutton, influential founders of the Picture Post, Bauhaus trained Lucien Moholy and Edith Tudor Hart, all immigrated to Britain in 1933 and 1934, followed in 1935 by Molinage and Tudor Hart's uh, brother, Wolf Sushitsky. The merits of the new photography were still debated and questioned in the pages of Gallery the Royal Photographic Society's monthly review of international photography, but the British old guard were irredeemably out of touch with the reality of the profession and unable to hold a radical transformation that would leave a long-lasting legacy in many fields, including the photography of architecture. Thank you.